sermon is uh, the essential foundation. Last week I made the comment, I want to remind you, the experiment is failing. The experts and the talking heads of our culture have convinced Americans that traditional marriage should be replaced with non-marriage, open marriages, cohabitation, homosexual marriages. They've been saying this for decades, and the statistics don't lie. Since the implementation of a no-fault divorce, divorce has increased 700%. Marriage and Divorce magazine in March of 1980, which is already a very dated thing, but still quite accurate in its statistics, says that in the United States, one out of three marriages ends in divorce. About 33%. However, they found that in a marriage where both people were married in a church building, the divorce rate is 1 out of 50. They went on to say that in a marriage where the couple is married in a church, attend on Sundays, pray and read and discuss the Bible, the divorce rate is 1 out of 1,105. Just like God said, right? Children who live in a single parent home suffer significantly more than children in traditional homes. They are incarcerated at a higher rate. They are involved in gangs at a higher rate. They are addicted at a higher rate. They, are, uh, str they struggle academically at a higher rate. They have a higher rate of being abused. They have a higher rate of being abandoned. And divorced or never married single parents who have the burden of raising the children report high levels of stress, poverty, and exhaustion. The social experiment in America is failing. The grade is not passing. It's time for us who believe in Jesus. It's time for us who believe in the Word of God as inspired by the Spirit of God for us to proclaim that there is a pattern for the family that God has established. He did it on purpose when He made it. He knows what He's doing. And when people follow that pattern, they are blessed by God and it shows. It is time for us to declare Jesus makes a difference in marriage. Can I get an amen? He makes all the difference. Many couples in the church today are underinformed about God's divine pattern for marriage. They long to see the blessings that God promises those, and they haven't seen actualized in their own houses. And they're confused as to why it is that some people seem to have those blessings and others do not. And many Christian couples are aware of what God has said to those in the home, to the husbands, the wives, the fathers, the mothers, and the children. They're aware of that. But because they're not fully complying with God's will through the revealing of Scripture, they're robbing themselves of the rewards of doing all that Jesus commands. But today's message is about this, that healthy homes are filled with a fully committed family, a fully committed family to Christ. They are living out God's will in their homes, in their lives, in their most personal relationships. They are living out what God wants them to be. And those are the healthiest homes that I'm aware of. So let's talk about the essential foundation. If you're in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be what? Fill with the Spirit. Now, fill with the Spirit is the point of this entire section of Scripture. Everything is leading up to and everything after that is pointing back to. This is the foundation on which all the rest of these verses are hanging or, or built. Do not get drunk with wine. Early on he says, don't be unwise. Early on he says, don't be foolish. 
Don't be foolish. Don't be gullible. Christian, don't buy into something that somebody says just because they have a PhD after their name. Just because they're on the cover of a magazine or they're a billionaire because they built a media empire does not mean they know what they're talking about, about the essential roles between family members. Don't be foolish. Don't be unwise. Don't be naive. Why? Because in verse uh, 16, the days are evil. And then there's another imperative. The imperative, do not get drunk. Don't fill yourself with alcohol. Fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In other words, be filled with wisdom. Be filled with the Spirit. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, it's, it uses another phrase. Paul says, be led by the Spirit. Those who are filled with the Spirit are led by the Spirit. They are guided and counseled by the Holy Spirit. And those who are guided and led by and willingly asking the Spirit of God to show them how to live their lives are the ones who are experiencing homes that get beyond the dysfunction. To be led by God's Spirit, you won't fall into uh, or fall for human philosophy or man-made morals. But because there are people in the church who are not filled, they're resisting the leading of the Spirit of God as revealed through Scripture. They're experiencing family problems quite significant. And it's not a new phenomenon. It's been around a long time. In James chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? James asks. And here lies the problem. We want control, don't we? We want our way more than you get your way. We want what we want. We dominate. We want our way and we want our opinions followed and we resent those opinions being challenged. And it's all about control. All of this is about control. And what does Paul say the apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit says? Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then you won't need to be in control of others. And so in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, I don't I guess I don't know, maybe it's just my observation. It just seems like we just we've just skipped over this. In verse 20, uh, verse 19, we, we talked a lot about that, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spirits. If a person's filled with the spirit, they want to sing. Amen. Your, your soul, your heart is filled with God. You're filled with praise. You're filled with worship. And the best way to express that is through song. And so it says it right there in verse 19. We're singing to one another. We're singing and making melody in the, with the Lord to our, in our heart. And we're what? We're grateful. We're thankful for everything that God has given us through Jesus. And I don't know, for some reason, we just skipped 21 and got right straight to 22 and following. But 21 is, again, another foundational statement that the next section of Scripture is going to build on. Because it says in Ephesians 5, 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Boy, that word submit, that already gets your ire up, doesn't it? Boy, that already gets you bristled up, don't it? That's an ugly word in our culture. It didn't used to be, but it is now. And so it's interesting where he says in verse 21, everyone submit to everyone. The, 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 the Greek here is a, is a compound word, under lining up. That's what it means. To line up under is what it means. It's a military term. Anybody of you ever been in boot camp? Anybody of you know what a squad leader is? Okay, there's four of us that know what a squad leader is. Squad leader does what? 
leads who? The ones right behind him. So, uh, you know, you've watched the formation in boot camp where you've got the whole company and they're marching in formation and you've got four, four people in front, don't you? Say yes. And then you got four lines behind them, right? And so as that squad leader, you might have guessed I was a squad leader in boot camp. You know why? Because I was tall. All right, now. It's true. <laughs> I didn't qualify any more than I was just born with a six foot, foot, foot uh, two inch frame. So anyway, as you're, as you're marching in boot camp and he goes, oh, hey, that's a boot camp language for do something. <laughs> All right. Well, that's what it sounds like when you're in boot camp. <laughs> and you're marching along and he goes, oh, hey, and you go pivot. And then you're going like this. Guess what? Every guy behind you is doing that exact same pivot on the exact same mark. And so it looks, it looks mechanical, doesn't it? You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about yet? This term, to submit, is a military term, meaning to get in line with, to get underneath, to follow the lead of another. Submit each other to Christ. And that's what it means. It means to be under others. Someone else is the lead. But it takes on a much richer meaning than the military sense. It takes on a more personal meaning, an interpersonal meaning. If you have a marker, you can keep it here at Ephesians 5. Go over a couple pages to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, what? Count others more, what? Significant than yourselves. That's pretty much the direct opposite of most any movie blockbuster. They don't make movie about hum humble people helping other folks get better. It's the power person who gets their way and makes everybody suffer if they don't, right? Here we go. Verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to what? The interest of others. This is the idea of submitting to others. Being in submission to others. And guess what? In Ephesians 5, following verse 21, all the way through 6 in verse 9, it, it is talking about this idea of submission. So what I'm saying in verse 21 is far more important in the Scripture than it is in a lot of people's minds. It is the point. Be filled with the Spirit. Submit yourself to others. And then he goes into detail. Wives and husbands and children and slaves and masters. And he, he expands on how that submission is to look in our lives. So without question, man, the wise have sure got an unfair brunt of verse 22, haven't they? Can I get an amen, sisters? Amen. Pounding that pulpit about 22. Pounding that pulpit about verse 22. Well, let me ask you, preacher. What happened to verse 21? Submit yourself to everyone else. Oh, wives submit to your husbands, and children submit to your father, your parents, and slaves submit to your masters. I'm, I'm certain this this idea, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, is probably carved in granite in some people's houses, or maybe on a baseball bat. I don't know. And there's a tendency to grab that verse and downplay everything else. And this idea of submission is enforced in verse 22. And here's something that's going to blow your mind. Guess what? The word for submit is missing from verse 22. 
it's implied. It already says in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your husbands, is what the Greek literally says. Don't you have the word submit in that verse? It's implied. Hmm. Well, maybe the, maybe the guys are thinking, oh no, there goes my whole theory. Or maybe the wives are thinking, hallelujah, the word's not there. But it is implied. It's implied. It is mentioned verbatim in Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands. So, been a lot of attention on this verse. A lot of skeptics, a lot of critics, a lot of heavy, heavy affirmations in Christianity about this verse, especially since women's liberation. But you know what it says? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives submit to your husbands, for the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything in their, to their husbands. Husband, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Do you, do you see that husbands are also being called to submit to their wives? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's submission, isn't it? There's no greater example of submission than to die for someone. And this is how godly, Christ-filled, spirit-filled husbands treat their wives. They give themselves up for their wife. They get under her to bear her burdens. They get under her to meet her needs by submitting uh, to her needs more than to, uh, to fulfilling his own. And this whole thing is about submission. Chapter 6 and verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now guess what? In verse 2, uh, excuse me, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children in anger. Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Father, submit to your needs of your children. They don't need you to exasperate them. They need you to teach them. And then in verse 5, it says, Bond servants or slaves obey your earthly masters. And then later on, it says in verse 9, Masters, do the same to them. Do the same what? Submit to their needs. It's funny how the critics of 522, Colossians 3.18, talking about wives submit to their husbands, it's funny how those critics don't complain anything about children submitting to their parents, same word, or about slaves submitting to their uh, masters, or about members submitting to their church leaders, same word used, all members in the church are called to submit to the elders and the leaders in the church, but we don't hear much about that. We don't hear complaints about that. It just focuses on this husband-wife relationship because as I shared last week, Satan went right after the core of a, of a home and that's husband and wife relationship. And that temptation and that sin directly impacted that relationship and he did that on purpose. And so there's this tension now within the marriage. And the fight is over control. Have you ever seen a home where the husband understands the wife's need to submit but has no concept of his own? Have you ever seen that in a marriage where he expects and reminds constantly that his wife is to submit to him but he never admits to his own need or obligation to submit to him or to her and their kids. 
where the husband demands the wife's sacrifice and ignores his own responsibility to sacrifice, to give himself up for her. Marriages like this are outside the will of God. Chauvinistic, dictatorial husbands are outside the will of God. Loving, supportive, helpful, nurturing, attentive husbands are what God asks us men to be. If husbands had done that, if they had been lovingly, sacrificially loving and supporting and taking care of the needs of their family members and especially their wives, there would have been no need for a women's liberation movement. Who wants to be liberated from a loving, supportive husband? The only reason for this whole liberation thing was because the men who were pounding their pulpits and quoting their scripture and, mis and misunderstanding and twisting its meaning out of place to force their control over their wives and forcing them to submit, that's where the liberation came from. And let's not be naive. Those statements of domination and chauvinism were coming from churches and preachers and fathers and husbands going to church. That's where that was coming from. But in my estimation, the happiest married women and women I've ever seen have been married to men who, yes, they are the head. Yes, they take that leadership responsibility very serious. But not to control and not to dominate and not to lord over. No, they do it because they're responsible to provide and protect. But the most happiest wives I've ever seen have been married to men who sacrifice for their wives' lives. They sacrifice. They suppress what they want in order to do what their families need them to do. And the, gee, that sounds like Jesus now, doesn't it? That sounds just like Jesus Christ. If Jesus was a husband, would he be telling his wife, hey, you got to submit? Did he ever tell that to anybody? Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? Yeah. You got to submit. Was that the language of Christ? I mean, did he ever question his authority? No. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Didn't he say that? Yes. Did he have authority? Yes. What did he do for others? What did he do for people? Did he tell them you better else or else? Better or not or else? No. He gave himself up for them. He loved them that much. So what can overcome this chauvinistic, controlling, dominating, dictatorial behavior? It is a love for God. That's what does it. To love God more than loving self. To love God and love those that God has given us more than what we want. The craving for power cannot be destroyed by anything else in the universe except for a love for God. Self-love is displaced by spiritual love. Self-love is displaced by sacrifice. And when a person submits to others, things will be enjoyable. They'll be good. More important still is the fact that you'll be doing what Christ wants. And what Christ wants more than anything else is for you to be filled with His Spirit. But you see, Christ can't fill you unless you're made holy. And Christ can't send His Spirit into you unless you are clean. So, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Have you been washed 
in the blood of the Lamb. If you are washed and clean, and God says, I will now give you another gift. I've already given you the gift of salvation and forgiven you for all your trespasses, but now I'm going to give you another gift, and that gift is, your, is my Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. And when, that's, when the Spirit of God, when He comes inside a person, it's no longer a fight for the top. It's a brawl to the bottom. It's no longer, you will do as I say. It's, what can I do for you today? That's what the Spirit of God does. If you've been cleansed. If you've been filled. And Spirit-filled people make the best husbands, the best wives, the best parents, the best children. Would you agree? That's what this whole series is about. Father, there's so much confusion. There's so much propaganda. There's so much rhetoric. There's so much error. And there's so many falsehoods. And so many empty promises. And so many people who don't even know what you said. Because they don't read their Bible. There are so many people who don't even have a Bible. They don't even care enough about your word to have one. And they're everywhere. And they can be had anywhere. And there are so many people that don't know what you said. Especially when it comes to the most important relationships in our lives. But Father, you are the Lord, we are not. You are the king, we are the subject. You are God. And we are not. Give us the strength that if you say it, we will do it. No matter how much against the culture and the grain it goes. And we trust your word and we trust your promises. And you said that if we obey you in all these things, you will bless us. We believe that, Lord. We trust that. Help our families. Help our husbands. Help our wives. Please, Lord, help them. So they might be shining examples to others who are so miserable buying into the model that is just not ever going to work. And help us, Lord, to be those shining towers in our communities, in our homes. And that people will see, if they will just submit to you and be filled with you, it just gets better from there. We trust that, Lord, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All these promises that people are looking for is available only to those who are saved by the blood of Jesus. If you have faith enough to stop sinning, enough to confess your faith, but you still haven't been in touch with the blood of Christ until you've been, what? Baptized into the death of Christ. You have been in touch with the blood of Christ and resurrected to new life. That new life is the best there is on this side of heaven. Amen. Amen. If there's something you need to do for God and for yourself and for your family this morning, let us know as we stand and sing.